Hello there. <laughs> I didn't see you there, walking in. Welcome to the humble hearth of Rob Anisi, uh, educator, uh, card game aficionado, grill master, and historian, and someone who is going to tell us a lot about how mythology and history blends in with fantasy today. So don't go anywhere. In fact, yeah, do go somewhere to the next slide. Oh, thanks a lot for doing this. A pleasure. It's so good to be in this cozy place. This is fit for king. <laughs> what? And a nice ambiance, and a nice fireplace, yeah. a nice woodwork. And I'll tell you, on a cold night like this, this is exactly what we need. Absolutely. I said we start talking fantasy. Let's do it. I'm ready for it. Let's do I'm it. for it. Me too. All right. So we have here... Robinisi, a.k.a. The Barbarian. Wow. So I think viewers watching this would know which of us is not the <laughs> Barbarian. <laughs> yeah. Uh, so what, uh, what are some qualifications that uh, have you have merited for a Barbarian? Mm -hmm. uh, well, you know, growing up, I've always been a a very guy, so you know, playing football, I was a lineman, wrestling, I was always in the heavyweight division, you know, just always throwing people around. But even in any fantasy game, I was always, you know, warrior, barbarian, any kind of those those big physical characters. I love it. Just, just love. I love it when fantasy and, and reality find uh, the middle ground, the common ground in our characters. Mm -hmm. Absolutely. All right, so. Um, I think we're just going to get right into it. Yeah. I asked the same question to everybody. What is fantasy uh, to you? I mean, I want to say it's a cop out answer, but fantasy is everything to me. You know, because fantasy is, is the imagination. You know, fantasy, you know, with playing a video game, reading a book, you know, you create those, you know, those images in your head, but also sometimes those images come to life. You know, like, you know, I told you before, I'm building a grill. And that, that's kind of started out in fantasy. You know, so I had this idea, let me make it happen. But, uh, you know, fantasy, I love you know, the imaginative, you know, things. And also, you know, in life, I'm not that creative. So see what other people can create is also, you know, kind of very eye-opening for me as well. Well, you use the word that I've heard so far every single episode of this podcast, and it has to do with imagination. Mm -hmm. Architect uses imagination in what he does. Uh, the adventurer uh, uses his imagination. Uh, I think we discussed more than knowledge. Imagination is uh, the key to creating things. And you just brought that up again. I mean, that's what we do. It's what makes us human and so different from other animals. Now. Yeah. So uh, your imagination, and you said you're not so creative, but I would probably disagree with that. You're an educator. Oh, yeah. uh, you teach history. Yep, history, and I've been doing it for eight years now. Eight years. I love okay. every second of it. You love every second of it. That's exactly the kind of teachers we need around here. Teachers that love every second of it, even when it gets tough. Of course. Uh, so, since we're at that token, how much does history and mythology have an impact on fantasy that we know of? today uh, i mean at least a lot of fantasy i've you know really dealt with it tends to pretty heavily impact it whether it's you know lord of the rings game of thrones skyrim you know world of warcraft everything kind of kind of you know pretty much intertwined which is, is always very interesting to see i have to agree uh as an educator myself we finished uh the vikings a little while ago kids were shocked to see thor mm -hmm. thor that's that's Viking. Like, yeah, that's Norse. Thor's Day. It's Thursday today. It's Thor's Day. So, you know, even that fantasy. I remember getting uh, one of my first uh, Thor comic books had Spider-Man in it. And he mm -hmm. said, who the heck is this crazy <laughs> lunatic? I said, wait a minute. This is real? This is a god? It just opens up this whole pathway. Yeah. But I agree with you because it is really all intertwined. Like a, a token was one of the first guys to to blend all that kind of mythology and history together. Mm -hmm. and, uh, I mean, uh, Lord of the Rings, I just, I just started, I just finished the first book, I'm on the two towers now. It's just an absolute masterpiece. 
masterpiece. Now, if I grew up, you know, I had the movies growing up, I, I never really sat down and really engaged with you know the actual writing, and you know it's absolutely mind blowing. It's incredible. Um, and it, it's very Celtic, I think, right? Mm -hmm. A lot of that Celtic lore. And I think The Witcher has more what, like Slavic or sort of Eastern European, maybe. Uh, you know, I'm not sure. I mean, I've, I've seen The Witcher. I've played one of the games. I'm not sure where exactly it fits in, but you know that that would that would make sense. Yeah, you know, based uh, on like the scenery and. Well, know. since we're on Tolkien, then, because. Everyone knows Lord of the Rings, even if they don't know Lord of the Rings, they've heard of it, they've seen it, it. exactly. Um, and uh, what was I going to say? Here we go. So Tolkien wrote a lot of this stuff uh, based on not just mythology and history, but from his own experiences. Mm -hmm. yeah. And you know, a lot of his war experiences, that had an impact on him, I think. Yeah. So history and mythology... It's so ingrained, we hardly even recognize it anymore. Absolutely. It's crazy. You know, but going back to you know, him writing about his experience, you know, you can see that imagery when he's writing it. You know, kind of the hardships that, you know, everyone's dealing with, you know, and then the complex relationships, even the scenery. You know, you really feel like you're there and it feels, you know, authentic. It's incredible. You know? Which, you know, it's sometimes that, that, you know, when it comes to stories, sometimes that's hard to come by, you know, really getting, you know, believing it. And delving even deeper into it, like you know, every time I turn the page, I want, I want more. You know, which is, you know, Do you think it helps to know history, to know mythology at all? What's your thoughts on that? No, I don't think. I think maybe having an interest in it, not necessarily you know, a background in it. You know, once you turn those pages, and you're you're in it. You know, it doesn't really matter what you know. It's you know what you're gonna learn. That's a good way to put it. What are you gonna learn? I think, in many ways, fantasy could be. Uh, a gateway to learning more about the history of, of these people or of, of Ireland or mm -hmm. of uh, Eastern European countries. Um, I think uh, it's, it's a nice segue from fantasy to history, that reality point mm -hmm. that we all need to enjoy fantasy, that you have to hold on to a little bit of uh, realism to yeah. think, all right, I can relate to this. Um, but knowing history, it's almost like you have a little edge in some cases. Of course. Uh, but I have to agree with you about just diving into it and not being afraid to be um, uh, enchanted by it mm -hmm. or horrified by it. Yeah. You know, really listen, like, you know, the, the spoken word has been around in all human history. You know, so those stories get, you know, get passed down and passed down and passed down really anywhere you are in the world. You know, so that fantasy, there's always that, like you said, you know, that, 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 it's always tethered to reality to a certain extent. You know, there's always lessons to be learned, you know, the, the characters that are developed, you know, it's always you know, waiting to see different interpretations, you know, throughout. Yeah, I, since you brought that up, did you see the movie Antlers? Uh, it was uh, taken from a short story about um, the, I'm going to spoil it now, sorry guys. Uh, the Wendigo, no. a man, very freaky, okay. but close to what you're talking about, the Native American legend of uh, uh, the Wendigo, uh, sort of like a demonic spirit mm -hmm. that inhabits a person after they have uh, cannibalized a man or eaten the flesh of another person. Okay. They become possessed by this Wendigo spirit. And that was just an oral tale, almost like a cautionary tale. Mm -hmm. Don't do that. And here we are seeing it in in form modern day people might not even know what kind of creature this is but then they might realize wait a minute this has ties to reality to history yeah i love that kind of stuff um so since we're on that, that token we're talking about tolkien the token of tolkien <laughs> um how important is it that a show or film follows the source material that it takes it from I think it's just very important, you know, because, you know, if you're a fan of something, you know, I've, you know again, I said, like, I've read the Game of Thrones books, watched the show, you know, read all the Harry Potter, Potter books, you know, watched all the movies, and it's, as long as it stays true to, like, you know, the core message and, you know, really don't really change much, so then I'm okay with it. So it's like going, like, you know, taking that story, being a completely different story doesn't make sense, it's really, it gets a little, a little weird. 
But you know, listen, the source material. Like, you know, if you're gonna mess with Tolkien's story, you know, it's a bold move. It's a bold move. The Rings of Power, I think, is a great example of that. Mm-hmm. They tried something new with an IP with material that is. I mean, I know there are some fans of Star Wars that mm-hmm. went nuts over certain things in uh in the new movies, but that ain't nothing compared to Tolkien fans. They don't play. Definitely in some cases, play. you go to college and there's actually courses yes. about his books, right? Mm-hmm. Absolutely. I mean, come on. So if you're going to uh, interpret some of his stories, you got to be creative, and not everything is going to translate to screen. Uh, but I think you hit it on the head. Mm-hmm. It's about heart. It's about the overall story. The heart is there, and things can change. You know, you can be yeah. creative. Yeah, there's plenty of creative people out there who grew up for the challenge. Exactly, and it, it's sort of introducing the material to people who might not have even known mm-hmm. there was a book. Yep. There was a video game. I run a, uh, an 80s, 90s club at school, <laughs> and we watched He-Man today. Wow. And the kids were like, wow, this is fun. And I'm watching it like, wow, I'm cringing a little bit, but it is right. fun. I loved it. And I, I realized the toys came before the show. Like the show yes. was smart, right? Well, did you, did you watch the uh, the toys that made us? Yes, on was that? That's on uh, Netflix, Netflix, right? Yeah, that was a great episode. Yeah. Yeah. Kids couldn't believe it, and in a way, I still can't believe it. You know, but it, it, you don't know. You look at this cartoon, and you think, "Wow, I wonder if they sold action figures." Well, look, guess what? <laughs> the action figures sold the show. <laughs> That's what this whole thing comes from. So, <laughs> yeah. So, but I have to agree with you. Source material is very important. Especially if it's widely known and you know fans are going to be watching it. Dissecting it. Dissecting it. And sometimes we're very unfair Mm -hmm. at certain things. But sometimes they're very unfair. Uh, When you put something to screen, when you pen something from someone else's story, I think you need to be mindful that there's a a great love. Uh, It's almost like um, a mythology in and of itself. Of course. Like a real person's mythology. Some people call it like uh, a Star Trek, a Star Wars. That's like a religion to some people. Oh, absolutely. You know, if you're not going to mess with that, <laughs> you're going to get some consequences, you know. You know, and my dad's been a lifelong, you know, Star Trek fan. And, you know, he, he sometimes he has the same thing. He has all, all problems with it in certain shows and certain things, you know, because, you know, he'll, he'll have an issue with it. You know, he's been part of that, you know, Star Trek for so long, you know. Yes, of course. And you know what? Some of them are just going to be like that. They're mm-hmm. going to say, look, I didn't like this because I think the Lord of the Rings movies had some changes. They had, yeah. I think they had to deviate from had the books to. sometimes, right? Yeah, well, as I'm reading the books, I was like, oh, you know, that wasn't there, that was changed. That wasn't there, that wasn't changed. No, but the movies themselves had you know, that core. It felt, it felt right. Yes. You know, compared to what the, what the books and the movie, like how they, they, they come together. I have to agree. And you know what? Kudos to Rings of Power on Amazon for getting me interested again. Mm-hmm. I have to be honest, I went uh, to YouTube and I started looking at all of the lore again. So I wanted to know what are uh, the Numenorians really like? Mm-hmm. And there's these giant men, these, these like supermen. And in the show, they weren't. They were almost totally incapable. Mm-hmm. But that show got me interested. Yeah. And I went, I went reading, I went watching. Uh, there's just so much at our disposal, and it's in our pop culture. It's ingrained. Yeah, mm-hmm. I'm here for it. All right, now you're going to teach me some. Let's hear it. So you're you're something of an aficionado, a connoisseur <laughs> when it comes to Magic: The Gathering. Oh yeah, At right. Least once upon a time. Wow. Uh, how did you get involved in that? In Magic: The Gathering. Can you remember? So this, oh, this is this is this is going back into my history here, back to middle school. Wow. Oh, yeah. Really? Oh, yeah. So there was, you know, this kid that I had some classes with, whatever, and, um, and then I got to be a little, little more friendly with him, a little more friendly with him, and then one day, like, listen, let's hang out. So I go to his house, and there are these, you know, you know stacks of shoe boxes. I was like, you know, what's, what's up with this? He pulls out all these magic cards. I was like, what are, the, what what are, are those? those? What are those? And now, now I'm interested because, you know, they have the, you know, 
you know, the different, you know, the different, you know, the mana types, different cards, and you have, you know, these creatures that are, you know, full of vines, you have vampires, barbarians, warriors, I mean, you no know, dragons, it's just, you know, yeah, like everything that you knew about fantasy is in Magic the Gathering. Wow. You know, so once I saw those cards, I was, I was hooked. But I had no idea what I was doing, but I knew I liked it. And you learned oh, how to yeah. play. You learned. You know, they, they taught me. It's like, you know, my, my buddies who, you know, I came like really, really good friends. You know, actually, the, the guy I was telling you about, he, he was my wedding party. So we, we've been friends for, you know, over 20 years at this point. And, you know, they, they, they taught me a lot. Man, what do you think the, the, the whole catch is about it? What made it so profound? What made it like a cultural phenomenon to you? What, do you, what, what was the thing? Because everything's possible with magic. No, there are decks that suit my play style. No, there are decks that suit my, you know, both my, you know, my friends, their play styles. You know, and, you know, whatever deck you have, you could always change it, you know, melt into something else, you know. There's also different, you know, play formats. So there's, you know, just, uh, you know, it goes back to the, using the imagination. It's endless possibilities. So how long do you think it would take to learn how to play a Magic the Gathering card game? What do you think? Uh, you could learn, who's never done you could learn the basics easily in one, one night. You could. The basics. Okay. You could tell I haven't touched it yet, okay. but I will. That's for sure. You gave him a lot of cards to, uh, you know, to get started. Yeah, I was so overwhelmed. It was like the Bible. I'm like, how many, how many, how many cards are in this? It was so overwhelming. But you're gonna help me with that. You're gonna teach Absolutely. me. All right, that's all I need to know. All right. So uh, here's another fun question I've asked everybody. So book, game, show, movie. If you had to pick one world, what would you want to get lost in? I mean, it's, it's a tough one. I gotta go Skyrim. I I, know, I know, it's, it's it's so tough. I just started playing it again. You know, you know, ten years later, I'm just I'm still hooked. What is it? It's just crazy. It's 2011. Yeah. yeah. Uh, it's just you're lost in this great world, and like you said, anything is possible. Anything is possible. Wow. All right, you're in that game. Yeah, I know. It's... Do, do I dare ask if you're anything except for a barbarian? Well, you know, the first playthrough, of course, I okay. went, you know, two-handed, ah, going, going crazy. But my most recent playthrough, actually, you know, with, with the mage build, just to test it out. Yeah, you know, just the, to the, see the what it's like. But, you know, with World of Warcraft, you know, I've made a, you know, a bunch of all warriors, you know, just because, why not? And you played online with all these other people, mm -hmm. got the experience. Yep. Do you like it better online or better individual play? Uh, you know, it honestly depends on how I'm feeling that day. You know, I've, I've you know, I've, you know, have both World of Warcraft. I've done Skyrim. You know, I kind of go interchange. You know, but I've always been to that RPG genre. You know, I grew up playing, you know, Final Fantasy. You me know, too. That's I what played, got me going. I played Final Fantasy X, you know, back when I was younger. I was like, oh, this is amazing. You know, that's that kind of just to, you know, play Final Fantasy VII. You know, kind of going back. Yes. Um, everything, yes. everything about it has just, it's just been great. You know, oh. I'm definitely more into the RPGs. You know, if you know, if it's in front of me, I'll play it. It's incredible, yeah. Final Fantasy really was so high fantasy for me, mm -hmm. and I too was hooked, even though it was really hard. You know, that, that Nintendo <laughs> hard, but I still loved it. The imagination mm -hmm. was going. Yeah, I can't wait for you know, Breath of the Wild. You know, the uh, Tears of the Kingdom come out. You know, Legend of Zelda. Yes, that's coming out soon. So, what was your your thought on that game? Everyone seems to love Breath of the Wild. I, I don't know what it is. I couldn't get into it. So my, you know, cause I, of course, love Ocarina of Time, love, you know, Majora's Mask and that. So my first entry into Breath of the Wild, I was like, ooh, I, I don't like this at all. But once I actually sat down, engaged with it, gave it a chance, and kind of understood what it was, now I'm hooked. Like I'll, I'll even, you know, take out the Switch every once in a while, start playing, and, you know, you just pick up and you go. Incredible. There's really no, there's no rules. You know, your first quest is to defeat Ganon. That's it. I know. It's like you could do it whenever you want. You can. Right? If you can do it whenever they want. It's crazy. I'm nowhere near on that level, but wow. you, you can. Sure. Um, you thinking of picking up the Harry Potter game coming out? Uh, like was it Legacy Hogwarts? Or uh, Hogwarts Legacy. Legacy. Yeah, I'll definitely give it a shot. I mean, I haven't really seen the gameplay yet. I haven't looked at any reviews, but I'm sure you know, I love. With Harry Potter, you open the books from like in third grade, you know, the dear time to have everything to read, and I'm sitting there, you know. <laughs> oh, yeah. The first time I ever heard a Harry Potter book, I was on an airplane, and I heard a mother reading it to her kid. Wow. This kind of sounds fun. 
And I didn't know it was Harry Potter until later on the craze mm -hmm. was getting big. Okay. I said, I think I was hearing Harry Potter. Yeah. Yeah. And and written very well. You know, just like you know, it's been re released and all. They have all of the um, kind of picture version now. Picture version. Yeah. Oh, I did see that. I saw it on, on social media. So, you know, when, when she gets old, I'll be reading that to her too. That's great. That's fantastic. Yeah. Well, we've reached this, uh, a part of our podcast. Uh, before we go, do you have any questions for me? Well, I know you're, you know, you have the, the quite the imagination. So uh, when you're writing, mm. you know, how, like, what is your focus on how bringing bring in history, you know, as a historian and then tying that to your, your, uh, your writing? That's a really good question. Um, you know, it, some books come with a lot of research and sometimes I try to avoid reading too many of one series because I don't want to start writing like that. Mm. I'm a little afraid of what, uh, what my, my um, written language is going to, to feel like to other people. I want mine to be very unique, but that comes with risk too. Because I want them to, to feel like they're in the world. Uh, but I think all my books are a little bit different. So there's this dark fantasy that I've written. And that comes with a lot of uh, history as far as what would happen if the world went black and hundreds of years have passed by. What would we look like if we never had electricity again, if we never had these luxuries again, yet our ancestors had knowledge of it? What would we look like? Mm -hmm. Would we have the knights in shining armor again? Uh, would we let nature consume everything? So to make fantasy, I think you're right. You need that historical background to a degree. Mm -hmm. uh, one of my books, Torn Asunder, is uh, historical fiction about the Templars. Okay. And that, I had to seriously uh, do a lot of research. And it wasn't difficult. I mean, starting the book, I didn't even touch I didn't even think of writing anything down. I just said, let me know everything I can possibly know too much about the Templars. Wow. Let me know so much that I won't even, it won't even be a part of the book, mm -hmm. but it's in my knowledge should it arise in a debate that two characters are having around the fire, it'll come up. Yeah. And sometimes I'll be writing, I'll say, wait a minute, would this have happened? Like for instance, one character was gonna go here, here, right? And I thought, wait a minute, did they say that yet? And they found out they didn't. That wasn't around yet. Does answer. it matter? To me, it matters. You know, I don't want someone to say, hey, they never said this yet. What is this guy <laughs> talking about? I hate the book because I'm here, here. <laughs> I don't know. That makes sense because like, you missed that detail without any larger details you may have missed. You know? Precisely. But yeah, uh, I'm totally on board with that. I love the history aspect to it. And I think that's why we get along so well because you're a history guy. You're a fantasy you're, guy. You're the same mind. Look, I had such a great time. I don't want to leave this, this spot. <laughs> but uh, until next time, guys, I hope you had a great time as much as we did. And I'll see you in episode four. Take care, Rob. Yeah.